purchased our freedom with his blood and has forgiven all our sins. Thank you, Scott, for a wonderful reading from uh, Colossians this morning from the first chapter. This is a letter that Paul writes to the church in Colossia. And uh, as he does so, he, he begins with this recognition of this growing and thriving church. The journey that they are making spiritually in their connection with God uh, and, and uh, connection with God through Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this the other day. Paul writes not only this letter but a number of letter to letters to various churches. And Paul writes with a certain authority. He's an authoritative figure, uh, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ. And I ask myself the question, if someone were to write us a letter today to this church, as it grows and it thrives and deepens its relationship with Jesus Christ, who would that uh, voice of authority be? Who would that figure be? Who would be our Paul? I don't know if we have to come up with an answer this morning, but it is something to think about. Who is our Paul? One of my favorite teachers over the many years, uh, many years of being taught, is uh, Reverend Dr. Frank A. Thomas. He currently serves as the Nettie Sweeney and Hugh Thomas Miller Professor of Homiletics, or Preaching, and Director of the Academy of Preaching and Celebration at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. He teaches both doctoral and master's classes. He is a nationally and internationally sought after keynote speaker and lecturer. He's married to Reverend Dr. Joyce Scott Thomas. Together they have two grown children. And he's also written a number of books. One uh, which is entitled, How to Preach a Dangerous Sermon. How to Preach a Dangerous Sermon. One of the reviews written for this book shares this. Open this book at your own risk. Now, if that doesn't make you want to open up that book, <laughs> I don't know what else will. Open this book at your own risk. It's dangerous because in it, Frank Thomas tells the truth about the world and the moral imagination needed today in order for preaching to be redemptive. Now, Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, talks about uh, the word, the gospel message, this message that is being shared. And this sharing of the gospel, here it is in verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you. Preaching is certainly a way of sharing the gospel, but it's not the only way. We do it. Well, the gospel message was shared, I don't know how many times, on our mission trip. We saw it both in action and in word, in message during worship, as kids came together. Um, we saw that gospel message of Jesus Christ so many times in so many different ways. But as far as preaching, there's two forms of preaching that I concern myself with. And the first is the, the easygoing sermon that leaves us feeling good, all warm and fuzzy inside, but doesn't call us to do anything with the gospel. And the second is the sermon that leaves us feeling a bit uncomfortable. It sometimes leaves us saying to ourselves, oh, wait a minute, 
I think I'm offended. <laughs> and yet that's what the gospel can do for us. It's the gospel that lets into our darkness the joy of a great light. Paul said, For it is God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But this joy is tempered by the understanding that the sharing of the gospel, the word, the message of Jesus is also terrible and dangerous. It's terrible because preaching the gospel of Christ well both troubles and shakes the foundation of the world. Paul knew, as, as we must also know, that to preach the gospel is to have a quarrel with the world. Isn't that a neat way of thinking about it? Just a, a wonderful turn of the phrase. Preaching the gospel is to have a quarrel with the world. It must always stand up to wickedness and injustice. We see throughout the world, time and again, injustice, wickedness, war, terrorism, abuse, neglect. I could go on and on. The gospel of Jesus Christ stands up against that. To preach the gospel, to share the good news, to live out the heart call of Jesus Christ in our lives means to have a quarrel with the world. As Christians, we take a stand. We set an example. We're a compass for others to help find their way. Because if not we, then who? Now in his book, Thomas asks the question, who are the moral leaders today? Who are the Pauls of our world today? Who do you think our moral leaders are today? Again, we don't have to answer this this morning. It's something to think about maybe in your bulletin where there's room for notes. Well, I'm not sure if we have room for notes because I didn't do a GPS. But somewhere in that bulletin you can find space to write down a name or two. Who are our moral leaders? Whose leadership aspires to above and beyond the normal divisions and categories of races, of race, class, religion, gender, politics, labels, ideology? And all of that stuff. Whose leadership raises critique and challenge, leaving us feeling uncomfortable, if not downright shaken? What models and motivates us to turn from pessimism, divisivism, and combativism? What truth is broader, wider, deeper, and higher than all of humanity? Russell Kirk said, we become what others in a voice of authority tell us we are or ought to be. Let me say that one more time. We become what others in a voice of authority tell us we are or ought to be. And if that's the case, then who are we listening to? Are we listening to the right authority? And if we listen to the right authority, do we find ourselves getting upset with the message at times? We do. And we should. That right authority, and you know I'm thinking about Jesus, stands up against wickedness and injustice in our world today. Are we listening to the right authority? Well, <clears throat> wow. I bet you all didn't think I was going to lay this really heavy stuff on you my first Sunday back. These deep questions. Originally, I wanted to talk today about families and relationships. And as I began to write this, it grew into something more deeper, much deeper. Something beyond a warm and fuzzy. 
I don't think any of us would disagree with the statement that families are really, really important. Sometimes we find our family is made up not of birth and blood, but of circumstance. Uh, Grace has a friend, a dear friend named Harvey. Uh, she was here at church maybe a month and a half ago with us, maybe two months now. She was adopted, is adopted, and has a warm and loving family. Her adopted dad passed away of cancer last Saturday. He was 54. And so Harvey suffers the pain of having lost two dads. It's hard on her, and it's going to be hard. But she has her family around her, a loving family. And, and she also fits uh, nicely into mine and Brenda's little family when she comes over and stays with us. And then there's the family that we work with. Uh, we spend more time with our coworkers than just about anyone else. And it carries over sometimes into our more personal time. Weekend social events revolve around get-togethers. Sometimes out, sometimes at one another's home. Watching football, grilling out in the backyard, hitting the swimming pool together, having kids involved in the same sports. Maybe we meet our spouse, the love of our life, at work. Sometimes a family becomes a real family through a crisis event. Uh, up until that moment, you know, we were, we were family, doing family things the usual family thing together or separately. But then this serious event happens that requires us all to pull together, to sacrifice for one another, to become less selfish, to put the other's needs before our own. And it's no longer what's good for me, it's what's good for us. But here's where it can get a bit uncomfortable a member of the family, in any of these scenarios, whatever family scenario it is, turns to Jesus Christ, accepts Him as Lord and Savior, fully embracing Him and His teachings, the call to salvation and the need to give yourself over to Christ completely. This person hears Jesus, sees Jesus, desires to know Him better and more deeply wants to spend time in the Bible, wants to go to church every Sunday, wants to be more involved in the way that Jesus asks of us. And so the person changes. Maybe slowly, maybe incrementally, maybe overnight. That's what having Jesus in our lives does to us. It changes us. It calls us to be something else. And I believe wholeheartedly it calls us to ask the question, what's good for us, not what's good for me? And so the person changes. And this person finds that those who used to be close have become more distant. There's less in common. There's less want. Uh, such as wanting to spend time together, wanting to uh, the same things out of life. We're having new priorities that take precedent over the old ways and activities, sometimes even people. The old priorities, the new priorities take precedence over the old priorities. And see, that's when this gets more and more difficult and more uncomfortable for us. I think it's uncomfortable even just to hear this much less experience it. So much of my time over the last couple of months has been spent with families. Families at the Youth Volleyball League. Who, by the way, won the league and the tournament. We have two wonderful trophies that uh, as soon as I locate them, I will <laughs> share them. Families celebrating birthdays, maybe the birth of a new baby or the birth of an elder in our family, maybe turning 100. Families together at our uh, joint service. Now, that was wonderful, just seeing 
both of our churches together on that beautiful day that God blessed us with outdoors and enjoying fellowship together. Families coming together over the... <coughs> excuse me. Families coming together at our joint service. Families coming together over the loss of a beloved family member. Families on the mission trip. Oh my goodness, you had to be there to believe it, but the, the families worked together and came together and cried together and laughed together and it was awesome. My own time with Grace on the mission trip was awesome. My family spending close time together during vacation was pretty awesome. Young adults leaving the home that they grew up in, moving into homes of their own for the first time, families grieving through divorce, families struggling with unemployment, someone in the family struggling with loneliness, feeling misunderstood and not heard, feeling like everything, thank you, feeling like everything is spun out of control. Who do we turn to in those moments? Who's our voice of authority? Who's that Paul in our lives? Where do we find answers when we don't even know the right questions to ask? Earlier I asked that question, who are you listening to? Are you listening to the right authority? You know, the world will tell us that this is the authority you should listen to, the nation's leader, the movie star, the politician, the talk show host, the newscaster, the fortune teller, the horoscope. I realize it's, it's actually printed horoscope, but I call it the horoscope. If we're honest with ourselves, we can admit this readily does nothing except to entrench us more deeply into worldly things. Whereas Paul tells us we are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To be fully pleasing to him. We are to, be, we are to bear fruit in every good work and increase our knowledge of God. When we do find ourselves being strengthened with all power, God's power, Christ's power, the power of the Holy Spirit, our endurance and patience grow with great joy. And God grants to us the gift of sharing in the inheritance of the saints in light. And in that light, we bring light into the lives of the people around us. We are brought out from darkness. We enter the kingdom of his beloved son through whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. This is the authority we're called to listen to. Worldly things rust away, dry up, and blow away, are temporal and not permanent. God is always. If you take nothing else home with you today, take this. God is always. The love of God is always. Let God's wisdom and love be your authority. Amen. I think we have a hymn that we're going to sing. No? no? Sorry, we go right into communion. As we ready our hearts, our minds, our body and soul to come together, we invite Christ in. We seek his presence, not only here on this morning, our time together, but 
in all ways and at all times. When the first humans found themselves naked and ashamed, you provided clothing that, so that the dust of their being might not be scattered upon the earth. When there was enmity between Jacob and his brother Esau, you wrestled with Jacob so that they might be reconciled. After Joseph was cast out by his brothers, you worked through him to welcome the children of Israel out of famine into a feast of reconciliation. When families dissolve and arguments, disagreements, and misunderstandings tear us apart, you work to heal us and bring us back together. How very good it is when we forgive and love and live together in unity. When Jesus had been crucified, dead and buried, you lifted Christ from the grave to reconcile the world to yourself. When time shall be no more and when all your children from every tribe and nation, every kindred and tongue shall be gathered in peace, your eternal praise shall ring out. Let us sing together, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> God of hope and renewal, pour out your spirit upon these gifts of grain and grape that they might be for us the presence of the living Christ upon us so that we might be empowered by and for your ministry of reconciliation. On the night that Jesus had his last supper with the disciples, he 